Can you see my screen okay? Okay, should I go ahead and get started? Um, my name is Melanie Ganey and I'm here with Wajin Wong and together um, we <clears throat> co-direct the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program at CMU Libraries. And we are also both librarians for the biological sciences department, as well as some of the other computer science and engineering departments on campus. Um, today, we're going to be talking about what open science is and how we support it with the program. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> so <clears throat> as you use the Emerald Cloud Lab, um, researchers will be generating huge amounts of data very quickly. Um, and one question that will come up is, how will you share that data? And really the goal of open science is to share as much as possible to make the data as open as possible. We're gonna start with just a couple of examples of the power of data sharing. Um, one that's happening on a global scale and then one that is right here at Carnegie Mellon. So um, as we all know, there has been a huge importance for data sharing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, from the very early days of the pandemic back in January 2020, the um, COVID-19 genome was shared in China. There were tracking dashboards happening in Asia. And we've also seen this tremendous surge in preprints, open access publications, um, data sharing, open source projects, all <clears throat> helping us to better understand COVID-19. Um, and importantly, this really sped up the development of the vaccines. But an important thing to know is that the cost of this rapid speed of publishing and sharing data comes with um, some retractions which have been in the news. Um, and so I think this will be continue to be an interesting example that we watch as the pandemic evolves and will help inform um, practices around data sharing in the future. When we talk about open science, um, particularly here at Carnegie Mellon, we're really referring more broadly to open research. So open science is a term that's widely used in the science community, but really all of the practices and tools we refer to could be used by any discipline. They work well in engineering, computer science, as well as social sciences and humanities fields. Um, and really this is an umbrella term that refers to a very large variety of practices, many of which we support with our program. And we'll talk about that in more detail later in the talk. But <clears throat> the ultimate goal of all of these practices is to make research products fair, meaning that they are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. There are many benefits to practicing open science. Um, so I'll just briefly mention a few of them here, but one is that it allows you to get credit for all of your scholarly output, not just the peer review publications that happen at the end of projects, 
um, but all of the interim products that you generate as well, such as data, code, workflows, protocols, et cetera. Um, it allows you to increase the impact of your research and reach broader communities. And this in turn really um, enables interdisciplinary collaborations. It improves the reproducibility and the reusability of the data. It is important for democratizing knowledge and research. Um, by getting all of this out from behind the paywall, you really are um, allowing a much wider audience for the work and democratizing that work. And importantly, it complies with both recommendations at the university level, as well as mandates from many of the funders and publishers now. Um, the second example I'm going to talk about is from here at Carnegie Mellon, and this is the Bolt 5000 data set. So this was um, a large data set that came out of the Psychology and Robotics Institute departments at Carnegie Mellon in 2019. And what was really novel about this data set was the sheer size of it. So in this project, researchers were scanning the brains of people while they looked at 5,000 natural scenes. And typically in these type of projects, a person might look at 50 to 100 natural scenes. And it's really the sheer size of this data set that makes it very powerful because it allows computer vision scientists to apply their algorithms to the data set. Um, and the power of this is emphasized in this quote from Nadine Chang, a researcher at the Robotics Institute who worked on this project, who said that computer vision scientists and visual neuroscientists essentially have the same end goal to understand how to process and interpret visual information. And this project really helps bridge that gap between those two research communities. This was actually one of the first very large data sets we hosted on our institutional repository, KillTub. And our former colleague, Anna von Gulick, helped these researchers um, think about things such as how to format the data for reuse and how to version and license it. It was also hosted on some other repositories just to improve the discoverability to um, both cognitive neuroscientists as well as computer vision scientists. Um, so these are all the type of things that we can help researchers think about. Um, if you look at Kilt Hub, you can see that this data set has been downloaded close to 73,000 times um, since 2019. So it's already having a large impact. There are already um, publications coming out that cite this data set. Um, <clears throat> and so we like to share this as an example of how <clears throat> Data sharing can really improve um, the impact of the research as well as foster these interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, I mentioned earlier how it's now possible to get credit for what we call interim research products. And I just wanna point out that um, the NIH allows researchers to cite these interim research products in their grant applications. Um, so, and also in progress reports as products coming out of the funding. So you can now get credit um, from the NIH for data sets, preprint publications, code, et cetera. I also mentioned briefly that there are mandates now from many publishers and funders, and this is a very small list of some of those that you might be familiar with um, if you work in particularly biological sciences or chemistry. Um, but this list continues to grow very rapidly. And really what it means is that the funders and publishers are really asking researchers to share their data that underlie the figures in their publications or um, their funded research. And we anticipate that going forward in the future, this will just become more of the norm. So um, as you start your research products, it is really worthwhile to think about data sharing um, as you collect the data, since um, it's likely that you will be required to share it at some point. Um, these are just, this is an article that came out in 2016 that talks about the FAIR principles and um, is a really great article on how to practice open science and open research. And 
one thing that we like to highlight is that it's not simply enough just to share the data, but there really need to be some considerations taken into account that makes it fair. So it makes it reusable to others. So a lot of this comes down to having proper documentation techniques, um, making sure that the code is well annotated, et cetera. And Wajin is going to talk more about that now. Okay, yeah. So now uh, the next part I'm going to talk about uh, some practical considerations of how to uh, share your research and make uh, your uh, make your data fair. Uh, so first, I want to point out that the fair principles apply to all the research products, not only papers, but also uh, your data that includes your raw and in intermediate data, and also software code, your protocols, um, and you know, lab notebooks, uh, notebooks as well. Next slide. Yeah, so um, the key um, in making, uh, in, in practice, the key in making all the research data fair is actually to use good data management practices throughout the entire research life cycle. Uh, here that you can see the research uh, process kind of in general can be summarized from the designing and planning of your experiments through the data collection and analysis. And then um, in the end, you want to publish and archive your research uh, product and the results and share with the communities and um, hopefully uh, optimize for reuse. Uh, throughout the, um, um, the research life cycle, um, it's good to use good data management at every step of the way. And here, I, I'm not gonna um, go through every details, um, but just wanna point out that uh, the key step is at the very beginning of the research process. Just uh, think carefully, um, uh, think carefully, because be as researchers often, we will work on a project where we're so focused on the results and moving forward uh, and get things published. And often we only get uh, start thinking about um, sharing, uh, sharing and uh, um, and writing up when we actually write the paper, and um, then we have to describe what exactly was done in our ex experiments and what data was collected and analyzed, uh, and how did we do that? And then um, it's also often because we do that because uh, the funders and publishers require that. But this is often too late because we can no longer remember how things were done in, in great detail. So the lesson learned is really don't wait until last minute uh, to share your data, but uh, plan it out in the very beginning. Um, so keep your literature organized in the citation manager, choose hardware and software uh, with eventual sharing in mind and choose electronic uh, notebooks that allow sharing and not only sharing but collaboration with your collaborators so it's easy to communicate um, and also um, to think about important part is also to think about the statistics and study design that you're eventually going to do and perhaps pre-register your study um, and another important uh, ingredient of this is to write a data management plan um, next slide so I'm gonna um, expand a little bit more on the data management plan. Uh, it's probably not new to those of you who, if you already had the experience of writing a grant application, but nonetheless, it can be very confusing, but it's required by uh, many funders. Um, and here's a example of by NIH, and this is the, their recent version of the data sharing policy um, where the, they provided more stringent requirement for data sharing and, and research uh, and sharing the data and research outputs. Um, so if you want to look at exactly what the funders want, uh, often you have to dig a little deeper, for example, for the NIH. Uh, so it is in this supplemental information that you can find what are the elements they're looking for in the data management plan. Um, next slide. So, but more or less the funders have uh, similar, uh, other funders may require different things, but more or less similar. Uh, so in a good data management plan, 
in general, you should consider, uh, consider these components. Uh, what are the data to be collected that includes the types of data, um, the images or genomics data, for so on and so forth. And asset amount, <clears throat> are you gonna uh, produce data in the matter of uh, metabytes or terabytes? What the variables are going to be collected in your data set? <coughs> Excuse me. And also some of the details of your instru uh, instrumentation reagents and your protocols so on and so forth. Uh, another important aspect to consider is uh, the accessibility and how others may use uh, your data. So related to that is uh, whether your um, data re would require spe uh, specialized tools or software to access and if access or manipulate. And if that's the case, then you should share those software as well. And then also should clarify the data format and metadata standards. Uh, next slide. <laughs> and in your data managed plan, uh, that, uh, there should also be um, preservation considerations. Just think ahead of the time. Where, where would you want, what kind of repository do you want to use? Would a generalized repository be sufficient, or do you have um, specialized um, repository like? Uh, like the um, SRA type of repository uh, that is more suitable for your data. And then the goal is basically, so this repository can issue identifiers to make your data more findable and, uh, identi uh, and identifiable, and then uh, people are more likely to use it and for the long, can be preserved for a long time. Um, and then another, another important issue in the, data managed plan is also to designate responsibility and who does what and, and importantly, what happens when the key personnel of the grant leaves the lab, right? So the research would continue uh, in what way. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so another um, another important part of uh, another important part of the um, data sharing <clears throat> that's uh, very important but often neglected um, is uh, some some of these day-to-day uh, -day data management practices. First is <clears throat> file name file naming conventions. So it is important to avoid special characters and, um, and, uh, and space, especially, this is especially important if you want to uh, introduce a programming and automation in your workflow and use the uh, command line. Uh, so for a, when you start using the Cloud Lab, this is going to be uh, something to consider. Um, and then uh, is, often good to keep the file names short, but the names should be meaningful and include necessary details. And the most important thing is to be consistent. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> and here's are some examples of uh, uh, file naming conventions. The top is like without using the file naming conventions. You, so when you go back, and if, uh, go back to your old project to pre uh, pr your previous work, you can, it can take a long time for, for you to look up for the files that you're working on. Uh, but with the proper name, um, file naming convention as the bottom here, you can see this started with dates and then the project name and then, um, then with uh, what this a description of what this file is and then who did the author and uh, version numbers of these files? I mean, uh, of these files, so it makes everything super easy to um, to in interpret. Uh, next slide. Uh, another important uh, seems obvious, but very often 
uh, messed up procedure that uh, often uh, that we often encounter is uh, that researchers often lose valuable data because uh, the storage or backing up is not uh, done properly. So a general rule of thumb, there's a three, two, one rule. So you should have at least three copies of your files, for example, in the hard drive or like in the cloud. And, and then at least two types, um, uh, these three copies should be on at least two types of media and at least one should be offsite. So ideal, situ ideal situation would be one of the, these copies would be on the cloud. Um, and one important thing to know is that if you do choose to have two copies on the external hard drive, make sure the hard drives are from different lot or batch numbers because uh, the hard drives of the same batch tend to fail at the same time. Um, and another important thing is the file formats. Just uh, for example, just it's important to use the non-proprietary uh, and lossless, all, all these, uh, this type of files. Uh, for example, use TIFF instead of JPEG if uh, the space allows, because uh, TIFF doesn't um, uh, uh, doesn't have any compression, and I use the CVS instead of the CSV file instead of Excel. Uh, here, I want to say another uh, uh, next slide. Sorry, next slide, please. I want to say one more word about this uh, CSV file. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there is, has been a lot of problems associated with uh, using Excel as a reader for um, spreadsheet, uh, because uh, as an example, you can see that there's a lot of the G names are messed up because when you enter the G names like uh, APR1 or MAR1, then the Excel automatically register that as a date instead of uh, a string of a, uh, or a name. And then when you save these files, like your um, it'll be auto-corrected to a date format instead of what you already have. So this is something to keep, mind, keep in mind. Uh, next slide. So next part, I'm, uh, I wanna spend some time to talk about uh, reproducibility. Um, because one of the main advantages of uh, using the cloud lab uh, is to make the results um, <clears throat> Um, uh, make your workflow totally uh, automated and makes your results uh, more reproducible. Um, so um, the key point of making the results reproducible is not only to for the scrutiny of peer reviewers or other researchers, uh, but the important part is also for um, your coworkers or your future or the future grad students who's continuing your work or for your future self to remember what was done and how, was, how it was done to generate um, these results. A um, lot of the daily things is that, that you can do um, that would help uh, to increase the reproducibility. That's not only, uh, some, of these, some, uh, some of these may look like extra work, but then in the long run, uh, you, would, you would know that it's gonna save you a lot of time so if you're working a lot uh, in a wet lab, um, it's important to document the protocols. This is, goes without saying, document every details and variations of every step. Um, and then it's important to use the re reagents um, that, are, um, that are from reliable sources and um, document the details, the origin of each resource. Um, and one, one, more, one important thing that many people often uh, overlook is the lot number, <laughs> lot number of uh, other reagents, right? Because there could be a lot of variation and um, there are a lot of uh, retracted papers and irreproducible results actually originated from uh, using the wrong cell line, not intentionally, but because the cell lines you just walk down to the lab, to the next door lab, and borrow some cells and or plasmids from them without, uh, without verifying the identity of the cell line. So that end up uh, contributing to contributing to a lot of uh, wrong results. And the last piece of here is the equipments, like the calibration and metadata of the equipments, are actually very important for 
with the results you get. For this piece, um, the advantage of the cloud lab is actually all the equipment parameters and metadata are documented and automatically saved. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, so next part is the, about computational uh, reproducibility. There are two very good articles on computational uh, reproducibility, 10 simple rules and uh, some good enough practices in the scientific computing. I highly recommend you to uh, read about, uh, read these two papers before um, doing any computational work. Uh, next slide. Um, the computational reproducibility actually starts from the very basic, which is organizing your pro project. Um, <clears throat> so from the graph on the right, you can see there's a kind of tree structure where um, some are documentation, but uh, then you should, you're supposed to have some directories like all your data would live under the data repository. And then there's repo uh, the, uh, the directory for documentation and your results goes to a separate um, directory that's different from your raw data. And then your scripts also goes to, the, to an independent uh, directory. The advantage of organizing your files this way is, is that you can, with uh, computational <clears throat> methods, you can, uh, it's easy to navigate through the directories. Um, and then that comes to the next point, it's important to use a relative path in your scripts. Uh, so the first bullet point here, um, so if I want to find the birds count table.csv file, um, from my, uh, I just have to write in my script uh, two dot as a, your parent directory, right? Um, because your script would live in the SRC directory and then two dots means go one step up and then go to the, the this tells you go to data directory and find this file. Um, but then if I write in the way, if I use the absolute path, like the second line here, the user Hua Jin project, then you can only operate this on this one computer. Um, on this one location on your computer, and it's not portable and not re uh, not reproducible um, at a, any different location. Next slide. Um, so it's also very important to document all the steps of um, each step of your um, each step of your um, analysis, and be very generous about uh, the text statement to explain. Uh, what this argument means and why you choose this parameter and um, what the expected outcome should look like. And this is not only for others to, uh, that may use your code, but also you're doing a favor for your future self. And for me, uh, this future self often uh, sometimes comes in already five minutes after I wrote the code. So it's very good uh, habit to have to write a lot of comments to explain what you have done in your code. Um, and also in terms of raw data and intermediate data, sometimes the most useful data are not necessarily raw because uh, it might take lots of computational uh, time to, uh, to arrive at an intermediate data. And from the cloud lab, this, this might be the most useful data form that you might want to share uh, down, the, uh, down the road. Um, so should that, like should, document um, uh, both, so it should be diligent about saving the intermediate, intermediate data at every step of the way. Uh, for the dependencies and computational environment, um, same, same idea as when I talked about uh, relative, and, uh, relative or absolute path, you want your code to be able to run on a different computer by somebody else. Uh, so it's important for you know, to document all your software packages and uh, libraries used, insta uh, including the version number. Uh, so for this, it's actually easier said than done to preserve all the dependencies. Um, so sometimes the best solution is really just use a Docker, uh, use a container such as Docker or uh, Binder to make your work more reproducible. And when you uh, 
do a lot of uh, collaborational work, then version control and tracking changes is also super, super important. And GitHub is one, uh, one of the platforms um, that's, really, um, that's really popular for people to do that. Um, next slide. Um, so for those of you, some of you might be uh, doing some work to um, do a statistical modeling or machine learning. So that's inevitable that you would come across some randomness. Um, is in this type of work, it's important to uh, write down or take note of your uh, random seeds that you're using to run your algorithm. Otherwise, every time you run it, it would, be, uh, it would come up with a different result then it's not reproducible. Um, you're, of course, you should test, uh, use, uh, do the test using different random seeds, but just take a note of what seeds you use. Um, and of all this, um, um, of all this, like we're talking about the um, cloud lab, we're talking about running a, a command line. Um, this, the goal is just to avoid man, uh, manual manipulation so that um, you have every, every, all your procedures in the, in the script. For example, you want, to, you want to say, I change all the NAs in my data to 0.1 and duplicate the first three cells in column A and blah, blah. So these procedures is hard. This kind of process is hard to describe and hard to reproduce and very error prone. But if you write all these in the script, it's very clear what you have done. Um, okay. And for to make all these processes easier, <coughs> for the, all the documentation pro process easier, um, there's, there are these literal, uh, literate programming platforms such as Jupyter Notebook or R, uh, R Markdown. So that uh, these platforms, you can not only uh, write down your code, uh, but add a textual um, interlink with the textual explanations and then run the code, show the results and the visualizations. And then you can also add your interpretation as well. So it's basically like writing a paper in the computational environment. Um, and when you're all done with, every, with all your work, when it's about time to publish, so make sure you share all your scripts, your analysis, notebooks, and results, um, and um, pick the appropriate license and optimize for the maximum sharing. But at the same time, you want to keep con into consideration whether um, the timeline of sharing and whether you want embargo, what, who do you want to give access to, and also, um, so, and then share in the repository that will issue uh, issue you a DOI or other type of uh, persist, uh, persistence uh, uh, persistence identifier so that your results can be uh, cited, not only the data, but the product uh, itself as well. Next slide. So yeah, back to you, Melanie. Okay, um, so finally, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about how we support these practices at CMU Libraries. And I'll just start by saying that um, the mission of CMU Libraries is to create a 21st century library. So this is a library that has moved beyond simply lending books to <clears throat> really um, try to support the future of research. And in our minds, the future of research will be that it will be increasingly open. So to help support open research, we created the Open Science Data Collaborations Program back in 2018. And there are five main pillars of support that we offer. So we license tools and support those tools that facilitate data sharing and collaboration. Um, I've already mentioned Kiltub, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, we also foster collaboration opportunities, particularly those that bring researchers across disciplines together. Um, we do assessment, um, both benchmarking against peer institutions, as well as research into the benefits of open research. We provide training opportunities. Um, 
both in the form of short workshops that um, cover various open science topics to longer um, two-day workshops on coding in open source languages. And we host annual events um, such as our two symposia, Open Science Symposium and ADAR, Artificial Intelligence for Data Reuse Conference that talk about um, the benefits and challenges of practicing open science. And you can read more fully about all of our services at this URL. And I'll also note that we have colleagues in the library that focus on things such as open access publishing. Um, we have an APC fund that can help support that. Um, and we also have colleagues that work on um, research data management and open educational resources specifically as well. And we are happy to help get you in touch with those folks if um, you need help in those areas as well. So first I'll start by talking about the tools. Um, I already mentioned Keltub briefly, but this is our institutional repository that can be used to publish any type of research product, anything from data sets, software, papers, code, posters, et cetera. Um, we offer custom support for uploading projects onto there. Um, and this is indexed on Google and it satisfies the mandates coming from publishers and funders for data sharing. And um, at this URL, you can read more about how to get started with this service, or you can feel free to get in touch with us as well. One um, thing that we can do on Keltub is create a landing page for a specific um, lab group or program. So this is an example of a page that's been set up for Marlene Berman's lab in psychology. She has shared many of her projects on here. And so this can be um, a nice single URL you can point to to share um, your work with others. We also um, have a license for a platform called Protocols IO, which is essentially an open access repository for step-by-step -step methods or protocols. Um, so it works really well for anything that's step-by-step, -step, both wet lab experiments as well as algorithms. Um, this is just an example protocol. And <clears throat> Some things that are nice about this is that it has very good versioning, which is incredibly important when you are troubleshooting protocols. Um, and you can either keep the protocols private, um, share them with just members of your lab group, or you can share them publicly. And one advantage of sharing them publicly is that then you can just simply put a link to that protocol in a finished manuscript. So that will allow um, a more in-depth methodology than you might be allowed with the strict word limits um, from the journals. Uh, PLOS One also um, has started to have integrations with various journals. So they have one for PLOS One now where um, you can actually have an article type in there that is a peer reviewed protocol. So this is um, an interesting thing to think about. Again, getting back to this idea of getting credit for these um, interim research products. So you can now um, have a publication that is an actual um, protocol in this journal. Uh, we also support and license lab archives, which is an electronic lab notebook. So if you are still using paper notebooks in the lab, this might be something to consider um, moving all of your documentation onto the cloud, which has been really useful for people during the pandemic, especially um, as we have to keep pivoting to this more remote stance. Um, so it's also very useful because you can share all of your documentation very easily with other lab members or your PI. Um, and <clears throat> there's um, a lot of flexibility with how you organize the notebooks. Um, we do have custom support from Lab Archives with our license. So if you email me, I can set up a one-on-one -on -one consultation um, for you with them and they will help you um, think about ideal ways to set up your notebook and how to get started. Um, and we also have an instructional license for lab archives. So if you are an instructor of a lab course in particular, um, this is being used by many of the lab courses at CMU now. Um, it can be a really great way for students to document their experiments um, in the lab courses. And it integrates into Canvas as well. Um, we offer a lot of workshops each semester on various topics uh, related to open science, and we actually have a lab archives workshop coming up on February 3rd. So if you are interested in learning more about how to get started with that, I encourage you to 
um, go to this workshop page and register for that. Um, but we offer workshops on everything from coding to um, using these various tools I've talked about um, to data visualization, publishing, et cetera. There's a lot of different topics. And as I mentioned, we sometimes have these two to three day um, longer style workshops where we do um, introductory coding in R or Python. And this is through an organization that we have a membership with called The Carpentries. They are a nonprofit that teaches um, introductory coding skills to researchers. And these workshops have been incredibly popular across campus. Um, it's a really great way to get started learning coding in a very supportive environment. Um, and hopefully people leave those workshops with some ideas on how to continue that learning. Um, Cause it's not like you're gonna leave an expert coder but hopefully it gives you a little confidence to um, continue learning how to code. And then finally, another um, service that we offer that I'd like to mention is that we can offer support for grants as well. We can write letters of support for NIH grants um, that outlines um, Kiltub as an option for data sharing and the data curation support that the Kiltub team can do. And so we've done this for a few of the faculty in psychology now. Um, so that's always an option as well. And finally, um, I encourage you to get in touch with us if any questions arise during your research or, you know, down the road, you think you want to get started with one of these platforms, just please feel free to reach out. We offer consultations on any of these topics. Um, so you can email us at this email address or reach out to Wajan or I personally. Um, we also have a newsletter um, where we send out roughly monthly with updates to new services since we're continuously offering new offerings through the program. Um, and then this is just a short survey if you have time. Um, it's just um, to help us understand what are the types of things you would like to learn about in the future. So with that, um, <clears throat> that's the end of our presentation and uh, please feel free to ask any questions if any have come up. Well, thanks for attending. And um, like I said, just get in touch if anything comes up that we can help you with.